For our sermon today, I'm going to ask that we turn to the book of Mark chapter 2 and verse 1. But as we do that, I, I, uh, I'd like to just recap on what we have been doing this past month. Um, F- Fred did try and, and give you a perspective about it, but I, I, I'll, be, I'll be a bit more detailed about it. On the week number one, we started with the, um, the opening statement was, what do churches do? What are we known for? And we agreed that a church is not a place where you know, people come to worship, but churches exist to make disciples. Along or around, in line, aligned to um, the mission of the church, we read in the book of Matthew 28 and verse 18, uh, where Jesus says, Go into the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey what I have commanded, with you, commanded you, and I will be with you to the very end of the age. We also went on to agree that the church is the most effective tool in doing or changing or transforming any society. But even more so, we also did agree that we as a church fail to take on this opportunity. And we call this the Caleb Report. Those of you who come from primary, it is Caleb. Those of you who went to, uh, no, those who went to primary, it is Caleb. Those who went to primary, it is Caleb. (laughs) But however we say what it is, we call it the Caleb Report. I went to primary. Um, The Caleb Report, simply because during the time of Caleb, seeing what the Lord had done through the years, taking them out of captivity, and now just at the penultimate stage, entering into the promised land, they got a report. They got a report that their big armies, fortified cities that they could not take over, the armies that were more experienced than they were. But Caleb gave them an alternative report and saying, yes, indeed, it's an insurmountable task. But in verse 30 of Numbers chapter 13, he says, we can certainly take them on. I say the same to us as we started this sermon series, that we also have a Caleb moment. And the Caleb moment here is, yes, there's an insurmountable task. 8.2 billion people in this world, two-thirds of them have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Could it be that we are in a generation with all the resources that are available to us and technology that we could be the generation that brings the gospel of Jesus Christ to the rest of the world. In week two, we talked, week one, we talked about reproducing. The following week, we also talked about the value of relationships. Last week, we talked about investing in leadership. And today, we will continue with this series as we conclude. So turn with me to the book of Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2 and verse 1 reads, A few days later, a few days later, uh, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered that, let me repeat that, so many gathered Uh, there and that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Since they could not get him into, rather, since they could not get him to, uh, to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, they lowered the mat with the paralyzed man lying on it. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Hmm, why does this fellow talk like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus, in his spirit, 
knew what they were thinking in their hearts and said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up, take your mat, and walk? Verse 10, But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say, get up, take your mat, and walk. He got up, took his mat, walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. This is one of my, one of the, my, my fascinating stories of the miracles of Jesus. Knowing that the audience, especially the teachers of the law, were questioning his authority to teach, to forgive sins, Jesus was particular about what he was about to do. Now, Jesus was coming home. He, he was, this was his coming to his neighbor. He had been away, and people had got to know how or who Jesus was. So he was coming home in the neighborhood, Alikwa Mtaani, just there. Mary, his mother, has a kiosk. And she sells mandazis. You know, it was that. So Jesus, amekuja, amekuja home. So in, in, in all itself, when Jesus was speaking to these guys, he knew especially what they were thinking. Let me give you a perspective. The paralytic and the thinking of that day, this condition of being paralyzed and confined to a bed or a mat was, as they thought at that time, a condition that was caused because of this person's sin or the sins of, their, of his parents or his, or his grandparents. And so to say that your sins are forgiven, Jesus was creating a drops the mic moment. Okay? And let me help you in this. So he says your sins are forgiven. Sindio wanamjua. They, they knew he went to Kongoni Primary School just down the road over here. They, they knew this guy, you know, uh, this guy always was being chapwad by his mom because he came. They knew these things about Jesus. I'm just assuming that. All right? They knew his father was the, the, the guy who had a, a, a woodwork carpentry shop over there. See, they, they knew. So who is this who comes to say your sins are forgiven? Only God can, but Jesus knew. So to prove to you guys that I can forgive sin, and at the same time, I say that I'm God, Zaya, Ebu Simama, take your mat and walk. And he drops the mic. At least that was if it would have been me doing this thing. <laughs> now, guys, in as much as I want to preach about the faith of this guy and, and his four pals who did that, in as much as we talk about the theology of this particular miracle and, and what the writer Mark was trying to be able to do, this is not what uh, fascinates me about this story. What fascinates me about this story is what happened next. My question to you is, who paid for the roof? You know, guys, many times enriching experiences happen, but we do not know or appreciate the costs that it has taken to make these things happen. The house that Jesus was in was already full. Imagine, guys, you just hear Jesus is in, is in, the, in the neighborhood. He's a celeb. So people go to see him. Maybe there are 10, 15 people, but it starts getting viral. Somebody starts texting, I'm say, Jesus, I may come. Aku wapi, aku kwa jumba kevo. So one person, two. Before you know, kevo, you have how many guys in your house? 50 in your house. It's full. And you're in a two-bedroom house. It's full. I'm going to say, you can't move. If you want to yawn, you have to step out of the house. I mean, it's, 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 it was that full. The milk finished, sugar finished, everything, even the water finished. So you can't flush the toilet anymore. Mujikaze you are saying. That's how inconveniencing it was for that person. He did not expect that. The audacity 
of those who, of the paralytic and his friends, may be telling, but nevertheless, with the teachings and this awesome miracle, the owner of that house was left with a big bill to pay. So I ask, who paid for the roof? If you look further through the Gospels, we do not know what happened to this former paralytic, neither to the owner of the house. But let me speculate for conversation's sake here. What was the financial situation of the owner of this house? Were they from meager means or were they people of, of, of influence? Was it a, a, a man who owned this or, or was it a, 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 a lady who owned this home? We do not know. We do not know if they were peasants. We do not know if they had a trade. We do not know if this person was a widow or a widow. We didn't know if they have children or not. We do not know the season of the year that this particular incident happened. So the immediacy, immediacy of fixing this roof, it, it was the, the hot season, maybe you could stay a, a couple of days before you fix the roof. I don't know. If it was a rainy season, you need to fix the thing there. Where would they get the money? All we know is that by Jesus being in that home, it drew such a large crowd, and after he left... This owner of this house had a hole in their roof and needed to fix it. I ask you, who paid for the roof? Last week, I highlighted the number of people who have passed through our Kinara leadership program. And a number of you have told me you have been blessed and continue to be beneficiaries of the leadership process people who are ministering amongst us, who we have invested in. But what we have not told you is that there is a cost. Like other investments, there is a cost to raising leaders. The work of making disciples of all nations costs. And somebody somewhere needs to pick up the bill. They need to pick up the bill to resource this movement. Discipleship making globally does not just happen. It doesn't happen by osmosis. If we go back in history, we'll hear of missionary movements or the missionary movement that came to Kenya. And missionaries did not just come to Kenya when the white man came to Kenya, no. But let me just assume, you know, that, that there were missionaries before that, but history is, is replete with Things knowing that the gospel did come to this place, right north of us, just in Ethiopia. But when the Europeans came with the gospel, do you remember in class five the name Ludwig Kraff? Okay, he was an ordained minister. Your book did not tell you that in class five. Ludwig Kraff was the first European missionary to Kenya. He was in Abyssinia in Ethiopia and then came to Kenya, and settled out in, in, uh, in, around the Rabai area. Now, check this out. If you go to the German embassy, right now in Kileleshua, the main building of the German embassy is called the Ludwig Kraft Building. Useless information by Gowi Odera. <laughs> but Ludwig Kraft and many other missionaries who came there on after 200 years later today, guys, we can celebrate to see the amazing work of what God has done through men and women like him. Today we have a flourishing and thriving church in Kenya that continues to make disciples of all nations. But somebody had to pay for the bill. All these individuals and many more have given up their time, their careers, their resources, some even the cost of their lives just to make disciples of all nations. They did not incur expenses just kiereere. Somebody had to pay for it. On week one, we talked about reproducing. That is the core. We need to thrive. And by thriving, it means we need 
to be reproducing ourselves. We need to be making disciples of ourselves. I said, each one of you, each one of you, I repeat, each one of you, what did I just say? Needs to be repro reproducing. You need to be at the place where you're telling somebody else, follow me as I follow Christ. Now, that person doesn't necessarily, you don't necessarily have to lead that person to faith. It could be that this person has just done it, but nobody has walked with them. This is an opportunity for you to be able to do it. And we said to thrive and to outlast our own generation, we need to reproduce ourselves in others. We need to tell people, follow me as I follow Christ. And once you reach the point where you have understood this, do this to somebody else. Our second week, we talked about our faith is best expressed in community. And we said there's a value in the relationships that we're making here at NC South. Somehow, these need to be leveraged towards discipleship making. And last week we talked about residencies, like in the medical field and other disciplines and professions. They go into a place of training where they grow in their understanding and in their leadership or their skill and we invest in them. This is key to giving this movement depth. Movements need leaders. And if we are not investing in leadership, then we'll be a rudderless ship in a tumultuous time or ocean waves. Today is week four, and as we conclude, we want to discuss one particular thing which I feel we keep on ignoring as the church in Jesus, of Jesus Christ. Discipleship making or the movement of discipleship making is not complete unless we talk about the place of resourcing this movement. This is critical. And let me explain to you why it is cri critical. Three things. One, if we do not do it, who will? Who else will advance the gospel if it is not us? Who else will commit to making disciples if it's not us? We, the church, need to recognize that Jesus did not have a plan B. You were it. Look at the person next to you. You might be uncomfortable about it, but look at them nevertheless. And tell them you are it. If all the churches in the world would shut down and close, and we are remaining as the only church existent in the world, it will be our responsibility to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. You are it, guys. Nobody else is going to do it. What a great opportunity that we can recognize what Caleb was seeing in faith. That indeed, the task is insurmountable. But surely... In his words, we can certainly take it on. The gay and lesbian community uh, lobby in 1990 made a commitment for 20 years they will work at mainstreaming this lifestyle in Western civilization. And if you look at it today, almost 30 years later, they have succeeded in many ways. I suspect that they have had uh, individuals who are lobbying for them, and now they even have governments who are doing it. And we see many of those Western governments trying to be able to, to, to move and to say that we too need to endorse those lifestyles on this part of the world. You see, they have that. But guys, it's only you. There's nobody else. You, the church of Jesus Christ, and the grace of God is what we have. Commit to making disciples, guys, because no one else will do it. 
but more so resourcing this movement. I ask again, who paid for the roof? Why is it critical? Number two, it does not make money. And where we do not see value for money, we don't have interest in it. Making disciples is not a money-making thing. It is indeed necessary, but it will not make you a profit. We are not about making money in the church. We are about making disciples. It is an investment in a life and a chance for each one of you to make or rather rewrite what eternity would look like. Let me repeat that in a tweetable tweet phrase. Discipleship making is an investment in a life and a chance to rewrite eternity. You know, it is said that Coca-Cola, their goal at the turn of the century was that everybody in the world would have at least one Coke each year. And at the turn of the century, they didn't just do that. Their marketing was so successful that you could go almost anywhere in the world. You wouldn't be able to speak that particular language. You wouldn't. Maurice, you wouldn't. But if you say, eh, say you're in France, je, 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 je m'appelle eh, Maurice Coca-Cola, Coke, Coke, Coke. Yeah, they'll do it. That's how successful they are. Think about it today. If Coke is able to do that, which I think they do, there are 8.2 billion people in the world, and a Coke is 20 shillings. How much profit are these guys making? Buku profit. <laughs> Huge. Massive. No wonder they're the Fortune 500 companies. But that's not so with discipleship making. It does not make money. It will never make the Forbes magazine. But it needs resources to accomplish this goal. Listen to what Paul talks about where or what the need of resourcing ministries was to him. If we turn to the book of Philippians chapter 4 and verse 10, Philippians 4 and verse 10, Paul says this to the church of, in Philippi. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you are concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever circumstance. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. I want to suggest to you that most Christians misquote or misplace this verse. You see, Paul was talking in retrospect, not about what happens in advance. We kind of use this verse as that genie bottle that we, we kind of rub and we like, ah, we're going to do this. There's a big task ahead of us. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. But that's not what Paul is saying. Paul is actually reflecting that God's grace has walked him even through times of plenty and times of scarcity. He goes on to say in verse 14, Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not... One church shared with me in the matter of giving money and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. And my God 
will meet all your needs according to his riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. You know, guys, we can learn a few things or something from the church in Philippi about what it means to resource. This was not a church of means. They were not. They were actually a poor church. The Philippian church were counterculture, where they are, and, and I hope we can be able to, to preach and teach from the book of Philippians in the coming months. It's an excellent book for us to study. But they were not a people of means, guys, but yet they were faithful. We can learn something about these guys and their commitment to resource Paul's ministry. We need to come up with sustainable ways of resourcing discipleship-making efforts around the world, not just here in NC South. I ask again, who paid for the roof? Number three, why is resourcing these ministries of discipleship making and church planting important? It is a long and it is a laborious, laborious task. It's hard work, guys. In a society where we want instant things, instant results, we are looking for faster downloading speeds, instant coffee. The microwave oven is an essential in modern day life. Fast food restaurants. We have been wired to get things quick. And check this out. Discipleship making and church planting is different. In fact, it is not something you can be excited about because it is long and it is laborious and it takes a lot of time. And with that length of time, people begin to get weary, people begin to get tired and even lose interest in this. However, you guys can't afford to do this. Now, let me give you an example. In the book of 2 Corinthians, if you can begin to turn to that, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, let me just give you a context. When Paul wrote this particular uh, book, there were some issues that were coming up. One particular one was the church in Corinth, which came from a very affluent pa part of, of the Roman Empire, had committed to be supporting what was going on in the church at Jerusalem. Now, this was the mother church. This is where it all started. In week number one, we talked about how there was great growth. Remember, now they were going through a famine. It was a hard time for them. And the churches had committed to support the ministries in Jerusalem. And for one year, they were going around collecting this amount of money so that they can take to the church in Jerusalem. And Paul comes to them and says, you guys have stopped you guys have waned. You guys committed to this. And in verse 10 of chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians it says, And here is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work. So that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. Verse 12, for if the willingness is there, the gift is accept acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Whatever was happening in Jerusalem was costing, and they needed to keep focus. We cannot, likewise here at NC South, afford to lose our focus. We have missionaries in London. We have one in Dubai. We have one in Ethiopia. And we're going to have many others. If we slack off in our commitment to resourcing these ministries, then we fail to accomplish this great task. Too much is at stake for us, guys. We cannot afford to slack off. We cannot slack the resourcing of such a movement, which is integral for the church of Jesus Christ. I ask for the tenth time, who paid 
for the roof. The resourcing of the movement of making disciples through church planting will have to be a constant for each one of you. A number of years ago, I made a personal commitment above my own giving of my offering and tithing that I would put a portion of my salary, of my income, towards church planting, specifically to what we are doing here at Nairobi Chapel. And when things have been thick, God has continued to be faithful in spite of some of my financial situations. And so, I want to challenge you, Nairobi Chapel South. Let's do it like no other church exists if it was just up to us. Above your regular tithes and offerings. This is something we can commit to. For those of you who are business owners, listen clear, carefully. Listen. Are you here, business owners? Listen. When you declare profits each year, I challenge you to consider a percentage of your profits to go towards church planting and discipleship making. It could start with 1% this year, but you could increment and say, maybe within the next you know, 5, 10 years, I want to be able to, to do 10%. But you can start now. You can start now. And you won't be the first. Colgate Palmolive is a company that was started in the early 1900s. And the person, William Colgate, who started that organization, purposed that he would be giving at least 10% of the income and profits of the company. Guys, it is a profit-making company today. Fortune 500 company. But it still gives at least 10% of its profits to its foundation and to the Colgate University, giving several scholarships, transforming lives. It's an investment that I think you should be a part of. I will ask for the 11th time, who paid for the roof? Maybe you could begin for paying for the roof right here by resourcing disciples right now. You could. We have an opportunity with our church planting efforts in Bondo. For those of you who are visiting for the first time, Nairobi Chapel South has been tasked by the entire Nairobi Chapel movement to plant churches from Mount Elgon to Isibania in western Kenya. That in the next three years, we should have planted at least a church in each county. We are going to start with Bondo. And in the next month or so, we'll be going out to Bondo and helping that. There will be a pastor. Who is going to seed that process with resources? It's not going to happen. Some of you will be called on doing it. This could be the opportunity. I want to close with these words, guys. Paying for the roof is a thankless job. It is not attractive. It is not sexy. It is rarely seen. It is rarely heard of. It is rarely talked about. You will not get your money. This is not 310. You will not get your money back. You most probably may not see the results of your investment. However, somebody still needs to pay for the roof. I ask you for the 12th time, who paid for the roof? Now, I have a theory about that Mark chapter 2 story. Do you want to know who paid for the roof? I've asked this thing twice. It's not that because I've asked it 12 times, there's a spiritual meaning, symbolic thing towards that. It's just happened that it's there. I'm, I plan to actually ask it 13 times. It's in my notes. But if you want to know this, 
who paid for the roof. I have a theory, okay? So let's turn to the book of, uh, Ma, uh, of Luke chapter 8. I have a theory to answer that question of who paid for the roof. Luke chapter 8. Are we there? Luke chapter 8. Are you there? Luke chapter 8 verse 1. It says this. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Namely, Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household. Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. Wanawake, oh yeah! That's my theory. Guys, discipleship making is our responsibility. We cannot abdicate it to somebody else. You guys need to pay for the roof. I've said it 13 times now. Father, thank you for the ministry of your word. And I pray that, Lord, we would be a church in as much as we might be a nondescript church, small church somewhere tucked in the middle of South Sea. A church of probably two, just over 200 adults who come here weekly. About 80 children and another 20 or so teen teenagers. But Father God, you used a small group of nondescript individuals, Father God, many who are unschooled, but yet, Father God, they started a movement. We too, Father God, can build on this. May we remain passionate, Father God, and Lord God, in our passion to see disciples made all over the world, that Father will be committed to Father God calling out people to follow us as we follow you. And somehow, somewhere through time, as we grow in this relationship, they would also be able to say the same to somebody else. That, Lord, we would be committed to growing our relationships in this community and leveraging them that indeed others would see how we love one another and they too will know that we are your disciples. Indeed, Father God, we are also praying that, Lord God, we would be committed to calling out those who are called amongst us to lead this movement in different ways and different facets that your grace would abound more despite the challenges they're experiencing, that we would rally around them as believers, invest in their leadership and release them to go into all the world and make disciples. And Father God, bless us as a congregation. Continue to bless the substance and work of our hands our places of employment, the side hustles we might have, the businesses represented here, the investments made here, that in Lord, it must be not just about our own personal gain. But Father, would you break our hearts by the things that break your heart? And that Lord God, we as a people of God would invest in resourcing the making of disciples. Father God, bless us, we pray. That Lord God, we would be committed as a church to this great call. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.